If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. Welcome back. We have RSM James Tate here with us once again. I don't think I need to introduce the man. He's uh, currently the leader. He's the one who has uh, got the most hits. Um, very proud of him. Very proud of the fact that he's here with us today. And now it's going to be interesting because he's going to speak to us about small teams. Now, perhaps RSM, you can just once again explain to the re uh, listeners here that uh, how many people that you have in a team and what did you consider on offensive and defensive? And then you had your recon patrols, which were very, very small in numbers. Yes, um, I, would, I would first start off uh, to, to make it very clear <clears throat> because people uh, doesn't understand um, the whole concept of special forces because they think of the name uh, One Reconnaissance Regiment or One Reconnaissance Commando, as it was in the beginning when it was a small uh, unit. And then we got bigger and we became reconnaissance regiments. And in the regiment, as I said before, uh, you get commandos. Uh, like, like, for instance, uh, five special forces regiment, uh, when it changed to commando to regiment, in the regiment, you get uh, the different commandos, like 5-1, uh, 5-2, five, 5-3, five, five, and 5-4 commando. So the word reconnaissance, now people will think that's all we we did in the past and still do because it's uh, it's mentioned reconnaissance. Now, uh, the, the point I want to make is, and make it clear, that that's not the only task we are doing because there's a, a misunderstanding among people that think that's what we only do is reconnaissance, which is not true. We do a lot of tasks, which one of the um, specialized tasks is reconnaissance. Now, if I can mention further uh, about the reconnaissance groups, um, in, in the special forces unit, uh, all members can do small reconnaissance tasks. But there are uh, a group of uh, special forces members that specializes in, in reconnaissance. And we call it uh, plainly small teams. Now, a small team consists of two members only. Now, if I talk about small teams and small teams reconnaissance, um, it's, a, it's a vast subject. It's, it's, it's massive uh, because the members that do these small teams uh, reconnaissance, they do a specialized training. And, and it's also uh, uh, a special breed of, of people that specializes only in reconnaissance. Now, the small teams consist of only two members, sometimes three members. Now, as I said before, we, we in Special Forces, we do reconnaissance tasks in the whole of all the units, but it's not as specialized as the small teams because um, to make a difference between the two, if, if um, a commander, or a group commander like in the operation, uh, like Grutia, uh, then a, a group of special forces will be detached to that group and that group can do reconnaissance for that commander to, to bring in um, valuable information and stuff like that. And that can be any uh, special forces member because they are also trained to do that. But to, to, to go back, and mention the specialized um, reconnaissance groups, like the small teams, they do specialized training just for that. Uh, and they specialize in reconnaissance. And that's what we call small teams um, uh, reconnaissance groups. Now, a small team, as I said, it's two members. They do reconnaissance very, very far from our borders. And they are cut off completely, no support, from the government or the rest of the SANDF. Uh, they solely on their own and they must survive and they must gather the information and bring it back 
to, to South Africa. Now, uh, what I want to mention about these small team groups, uh, as I said, they do a four-month specialized training to do this. And if they do a small team um, operation or a reconnaissance mission, then they will um, move away. They will get dropped off or by boat or by aircraft or by parachuting or halo hayo, which stands for high altitude low opening or high altitude uh, high opening. Um, and then they will fly towards a certain point with that parachute and land. And from there, they will hit the parachutes and, um, and, and walk from there the rest of the distance to the, to the target where they must do the reconnaissance. Now, these, these small team uh, operators, they, they do defensive work. They will not make contact with the enemy at all. Because remember, a small team is not a fighting team. They cannot make contact with the, uh, with the enemy because they're far away from home and they must make it back and they must survive on their own. If I can uh, just mention uh, some of our operators, uh, operators that were very, very good in this type of, of work was uh, uh, Captain Diedrich. He later became a colonel and a commander, uh, but died of cancer later. So rest in peace for, for Colonel Diedrich. When he was still a, a lieutenant and a captain, he specialized in, 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 in this type of reconnaissance. And he also wrote a book on it. Uh, I can't remember the name of the book, but it's written by Colonel Tietrich. And um, they mentioned some of these, these operations. Now, some of these operations that Colonel Tietrich did with one Portuguese guy, a black person, a black operator, that can speak Portuguese because you need it, uh, you know, for, for survival if he has to talk himself out of a situation. So uh, it was all, always a, a member that can speak the language uh, in the area where they do this reconnaissance. Now I want to get back to, to one specific operation that Colonel Dietrich did. Um, I can't remember the target and where it was, but it was 72 days that they did this, uh, this mission. Now, you can think for yourself, to, to go on a mission 72 days, you must have water for 72 days and also rations, um, food for, for that 72 days. Now, what they did is they had over 200 kilogram of, of equipment. Now, you cannot carry 200 kilogram of equipment. So they got dropped off at a certain point. Uh, I can't remember if it was uh, by aircraft or by, by boat. And um, they stashed some of the equipment and then they walk the distance, stash that equipment, walk back all the way, and then take the rest of the equipment to the, to the area. And they worked in that vicinity for, for 72 days. That was the length of the operation. Now, uh, 200 kilograms of equipment and food and water is not enough. There's no way that that can last 72 days. So they have to live from the, from the bush, from, from game, from, from whatever, and survive. And, and we are all um, uh, uh, trained to, to survive in the bush. So uh, Colonel Diedrichs, when he was a captain, when he did this operation, they had to survive from the bush as well to supplement, uh, you know, the food that they had because it was definitely not enough. And then they got water from pools and dams and rivers and stuff like that. And they did the operation. They came back completely um, um, clandestine, in a clandestine way. They did it and they came back and they brought valuable um, information to, to the country and to the SANDF for further actions. In other words, um, they do task, these small team uh, uh, groups, they do reconnaissance uh, and bring back valuable information 
for a task or a big attack or whatever that must take place at the later stage. Now, good reconnaissance uh, is, is time never wasted and it saves lives at the end because good reconnaissance that's on terrain and the enemy um, with good sketches and, and they, they, uh, they um, observe a base or that target for days and see what the, the structure is all about and what the um, opus memorandum is for the, for the day, you know, the enemy, uh, how is the guards doing and what time do they, do they um, relieve each other and stuff like that. It's valuable um, information that a, a, a task commander need if, let's say, if they must attack that target, uh, then he's got the correct information and photos and sketches because that is what they're doing. They take photos, um, they, they make sketches, and they put in the sketches distances and all that stuff. And that is very valuable information for a task commander to, to attack that specific target or demolish a target or whatever the case might be. And normally, uh, these, these reconnaissance stars is not a reconnaissance task for the rest of the SND. It is a reconnaissance task for special forces. In other words, they come back uh, with the information uh, and then um, we plan to, to um, attack this base at the later stage. And then they started to plan and rehearse, and then they will attack that base. And a good a good example of this specific um, type of work, uh, this reconnaissance that I'm referring to, is the Matola rate. The Matola rate was such a, a reconnaissance task, which was perfect. I mean, the information I got, because I took part in that operation, when I got to that target, it felt to me that I've been there, the distances, the photos, the, the, the models they built uh, for, the, for this specific uh, operation, it, it felt to me that I've been there before. So accurate was this information that they got from uh, a reconnaissance they did prior to this big operation. So these people can operate in a city environment as well. They don't have to be like hidden in an observation post right next to a base an enemy base, say, somewhere in the, in the more rural area. But I'm still wondering how they would have done that. I mean, this is not... There's people around it. <laughs> it's not the felt, it's not empty. Yeah, it was... You mean, uh, are you referring to the... Uh, to um, the libido rate? The, yes, the any, the, one of them, the any one of them. Any one of them. I mean... How do they, how are they not felt? Well, you see, of course, it, it, it's quite interesting. When we started to do that operation, I think I did mention it on a previous talk, uh, we, we rehearsed six months before the time. We rehearsed on this operation. And, and the members that took part in that operation didn't even know what they are going to do. Uh, we started with with other training and rehearsing and stuff like that, and we didn't know what the task was at, at hand. But later, when we moved to to Longabon in the Cape, and we started to rehearse there, then we started to know, uh, you know, we're not we're not <laughs> stupid. Uh, then we spoke among each other and said, "Listen, something is going to happen. We don't do this for nothing, and we're not in Longabon for nothing." So then later they gave us orders and we were not allowed to leave the base for security reasons and stuff like that. And when, then we started to rehearse intensively for that specific operation. So um, I know that a lot of people think that we only work in, in, in bush type of, of environment, which is not true. We can do operations anywhere. And uh, specifically, Libido was in the middle of a town. I mean, we, we entered this target from, from the sea with boats. And um, we went ashore and, uh, and we went into the target 
unnoticeable and we uh, demolished the target. Uh, we we uh, planted mines and we left the place and we went back to the boats and we demolished this whole uh, and it was three targets. It was a cement factory, it was a, a gas factory, and, and then this oil refinery uh, that we demolished. Would they carry different rifles or look differently from a fighting patrol? Like the ones you people did in uh, Mozambique? Yes. yes uh, uh, we do, do carry arms and uh, equipment uh, to protect ourselves. So we must have good good weaponry uh, but we don't take heavy weapons like in the past in a, in a big patrol group like mortars and and uh, machine guns you know LMGs and stuff like that it's only personal equipment and silenced weapons if we have to need, need it you know to take out guards or patrollers or whatever um, you know so that we don't make a big noise so we can carry on with the task if you use a weapon, that doesn't have a silencer on, it will make a hell of a noise and then you must withdraw. You cannot carry on with the task. With the task. So um, it is important that, that all, the, all the members in the team still carries his, his uh, personal weapon and a pistol that we always have pistols on us and uh, AK-47 um, or, or the weapon that that they decided we must use, but never heavy, uh, heavy uh, weapons because the task is only in and out. It's a, it's a few hours. Uh, it's not like um, you know a bush task uh, attacking a base or something like that. That's completely different. So the weapons is only personal weapons and light weapons, not heavy weapons. I suppose in the new special forces. Um... Snipers play a much bigger role than they what, if, what they probably did with in your days in the bush. Or am I wrong when I say that? Uh, we use snipers only for four specific tasks. Uh, you don't use a, a, a sniper in a in a in a team. Um, like for instance, um, a small group that must go and attack or demolish a, a target. Then you don't use snipers for that. Because a sniper weapon doesn't have a silence on. Because a, 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 a sniper weapon must be um, a, a normal charge to, to shoot accurately. So you cannot have a subsonic uh, ammunition uh, to use in a task so, so that the enemy don't hear you. So uh, snipers are used only in specific tasks uh, where, where um, they must take out a target and it's going to make a noise and over long distances. So uh, most of the tasks that we do, we don't uh, use, make use of snipers at all. Okay, yeah, because if a sniper shoots somebody, let's say a high value target, then obviously people know he's been shot. The enemy will know it. But the sniper got him and then they start searching and so those people are then automatically on their own. They have to get away from the, you know, from the contact point. So that makes sense to me. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, important that uh, the snipers you used, uh, we used in the, in the, in the past, um, shot a specific, um, let's say, a specific person at a very long range. And I think the longest range that we, one of our snipers, took out. Uh, a commander of, a, uh, I think it was a missile or a mortar team, was uh, 1.7 kilometers when he hit the target. So we've got brilliant, brilliant uh, snipers. Yes, I've heard about that. It's something like the third longest shot in the world or something. There was some kind of a record uh, which happened. I uh, probably used the Trevelo. I wouldn't know the details. Nobody really? knows. Yeah. Yeah, because not not a lot of people know the Trevelo rifles, and I I actually shot with one, really really good. You, you cannot blame the rifle; it's you if you miss the target. That's yeah, for sure. For sure, really good. Yeah. But if you say, if if let's say you want to go and blow a bridge like the Giral Bridge, which we know happened, 
would there be one of these yep. small teams where before we actually let that team uh, arise? Oh yes, it's it's crucial. Uh, you will send a, a a reconnaissance team to do a reconnaissance, let's say on a bridge or tunnel or whatever the case may be, um, a, a task that must get demolished. Uh, a reconnaissance team must go there and 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 do a reconnaissance on that specific target because um, you know you don't know how much explosive uh, explosives to carry. So. The reconnaissance team will do measurements of the thickness of the pillars of a bridge, for instance, if I can make, take that as an example. Uh, they measure the, the pillar sizes and, and width and, and stuff like that. And when they bring that information back, uh, we know exactly how to prepare the explosives to demolish that bridge. Because if you don't know what the, what the, uh, the target is, um, and the measurements and stuff, then you might carry maybe not enough um, explosives and the, and the target will not be demolished, demolished successfully or you, you carry too much, so much uh, explosives that you can't carry. So it, it is very important to, to prepare the, the charges and the equipment to, to demolish that bridge or whatever the target may be. So, no, reconnaissance is crucial in this in this sense. Well, yeah, I suppose because you don't have time to waste on a target. I mean, once you get to that target, it needs to be rigged with explosives and you get out. You're not going to hang around there. Yeah, for sure. No. Um, reconnaissance, uh, the information from very good reconnaissance, you go there, you know exactly what to do, uh, and that saves a lot of time as well. And um, that's why um, the small teams and reconnaissance on a target like like the Libito raid was, was very crucial to do the right thing. Would it be possible, I remember you told me that the way you brief people in special forces is something unique, that you would be briefed until the very last matter, which everybody will understand exactly what he, what he would do. Would it be possible, could it happen that one of the guys who actually did the reconnaissance, that he would come and do the briefings himself? If a team was going to attack no. whatever you looked at? No, uh, what, what is interesting in the, in the targets that we attacked in the past, the, the members that did the reconnaissance, we never knew who did it. Only later we found out that they did it, and also in, in many uh, in many of these cases, the reconnaissance team is then divided into the the team that's going to attack this target or demolish a target. Then they're in the team, and still we never knew that they did the reconnaissance. Only afterwards they say they did the reconnaissance on that task. I must ask if I've ever made a mistake. If you ever got to a target and it didn't look like you expected. <laughs> no, no, I, I didn't experience it. Maybe someone else, but not me. No. Yeah, this is amazing. No, really, I, I must admit, I must admit, uh, the reconnaissance uh, that was done in the past by these small teams is so accurate and so perfect that, as I mentioned before, that. Uh, to use the example of the libido rate, the, that was so perfectly done. It, it was like I've been there before, so accurate it was. So they spend, uh, remember the saying I said, uh, time spending on reconnaissance is, is uh, it's not time wasted. And it saves a lot of time and it saves a lot of, uh, can save lives. So it must be accurate. They must spend time and collect the correct information about that target and bring the information back. Would it be possible for them, I don't know if this happened, I'm just thinking aloud, but let's say they are looking at this bridge and they're doing their measurements. Would it be possible to break something off that bridge with the concrete and bring it down so you can see exactly what, how it's made? Or, or wouldn't you go that far? I know it's hard to get concrete off a bridge, off, off a bridge but uh, is such a thing possible? 
No, I don't. I don't think uh, taking off samples is the way to go. Uh, I think the photos and uh, and um, measurements and stuff like that is accurate enough. Uh, remember, uh, the, we we demolished bridges in the past, uh, and the reconnaissance done on those bridges is given to to. Uh, uh, a very high qualified uh, uh, DEMS uh, expert. And he looks at the photos and he, he will know exactly what that bridge is built of. Um, and he will uh, take the measurements and he will say, you must use this explosives and the amount and the charge that you must place must look in this fashion to, to demolish the bridge. Um, I just want to mention that uh, if you demolish a bridge, you you use the the weight of the bridge bridge to demolish itself. So you take out the pillars, and the weight of the bridge will demolish itself. So you must just cut the pillars, and that's it, and the bridge will fall. Uh, and, and I mean, if you if the enemy or that country or whatever must rebuild that bridge, it's going to take years to build it. It's, so it will be demolished completely. Yeah, what's fascinating to me, uh, sir, is that you cannot really measure something without being right next to it. So I can just imagine these, these two guys, I don't know, if they go one by one and the other one cover the other one, or if they both of them go to the, to the bridge and start measuring quickly, and, and this happens in the dark. Yeah, they, all our reconnaissance on a target is done at night. So um, what they will do is a reconnaissance group like that will first uh, walk around the target and see what is going on and, and, and look at the target for, for quite a while, you know, maybe days, maybe hours. Uh, but a bridge is not that difficult. I mean, if you take a bridge to demolish a bridge in the middle of a country, uh, normally it's not guarded. Um, it happened before that bridges were guarded because they, they knew that bridges is, uh, can be demolished. No, because it will, it will hamper the infrastructure, to, <clears throat> you know, the convoys to travel, to, to move um, special equipment, to different bases and stuff. Um, and um, if you take a target like a bridge, it's much easier than a target like the libido raid. I mean, the libido raid is in the, the target was in the middle of a town. So, so that reconnaissance is completely different from, from a reconnaissance on a bridge. So each target has got a different, um, Intensi intensity of, of, of reconnaissance. <clears throat> um, we did uh, demolish bridges in the past where we took an overkill. We call it overkill where we carry <clears throat> a lot of uh, explosives and, and, and just put the charges and blow the bridge and then you hope for 100% uh, success. So we did some tasks in the past demolishing bridges and, and tunnels and, and, and paths and stuff uh, without reconnaissance. Then they just take an overkill of, of explosives and just demolish the whole bridge. But then that's a very big explosion then. Tell me about Special Forces photography, because I know that's one of the courses and I can imagine that this, this small team would be trained in that and how to take pictures. Yeah, uh, that, uh, that is a crucial part of, of a small team uh, uh, that, that must go very far and, 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 and do reconnaissance on, on a target. Um, all the small teams are qualified um, photographers. In other words, they did a course on, on, uh, on photography. So uh, the course consists of two parts. The first one is basic photography and the advanced one is advanced photography. So um, they all did this course and it's a six week course, a three week basic, three week advanced. It's a six week course to do um, 
um, photography. Now, I just want to mention something about this photography. What we also uh, been taught on 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 the photography course is how to take photos at night. You can think for yourself. You cannot go around with a camera with a flash on and and take photos with a, a flash that flashes the whole time if you take photos. So a part of this course, this photography course, is how to take photos at night uh, with a camera without a, um, a flash because all our reconnaissance is mainly in the night um, and they take photos at night and um, they've been taught how to use a camera um, to take photos at night uh, just by using the shutter of the the camera to keep it open at a very long time. And if you develop the spool uh, of these cameras, um, the photo will look as if it is taken in daytime. So it is clear, you will think it's taken in daytime. So clear is the, is the photo. You will not say it's taken at night. Are these cameras specially built for him? Or is it just a normal one which they modify? Now, all the cameras we use is normally uh, cameras that we buy at shops. You know, very high-tech uh, cameras. And, 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 and it must be a manual camera because automatic cameras doesn't work for us. It must be a uh, more old-type uh, camera that still uses the, the spool. Uh, you know, the, the film that you put in. Um, I don't know nowadays if there are much more advanced cameras. I think there is. Uh, but in the days when I did the photography course, that's the way to do it. We have to go out at night on course for the practical phase, and we have to take photos at night with a camera on a tripod. It must, you must use a tripod because uh, that camera must stand still for, for a few seconds, you know, with the shutter open, so it can take in all the light, so you can get the complete image of that target. So it's it's quite an amazing thing to do is to take photos at night without a without a flash. I can just imagine. I can imagine what other pictures they took. I mean, would it be possible that they see some wildlife and they decide, okay, we've done the mission already. We're on the way back. Let's take a picture of of the wildlife. Or is that out of the question? Yeah. Do you do you mean at night? Yes, at night, sir. Let's say they've done their reconnaissance and they, they withdrawing now, they're going back to South Africa, they're walking, see something nice here, a lion, I don't know, something. Uh, would, would they then want to take a picture or, or just ignore it and carry on? Okay, I, I must mention that this, we don't do it in the first place, but if they do it, remember I said at night, we don't use a flash. So, the shutter must be, the camera must be on the tripod, it must be kept still, and the shutter must be open for seconds, for, for, for half, half a minute to a minute. I mean, the animal moves. Now, how, how will you take a photo of a, a moving target? You cannot do that. So it's not possible. No, no that answers my question. Thank you. <laughs> now, you're just thinking, you know, because these photographers have a brain of their own. I mean, they really love to take pictures. But I suppose, yeah, it's, it's a job. It's not for pleasure. No, it's not. Yeah. Well, this is amazing because it means to me that if he deploys by parachute, he's jumping with his tripod, <laughs> he's jumping with his, his camera and all his equipment. Yeah, I can understand why it's weighing 200 kilos. I mean, those days, uh, these things were quite yeah. hefty. It was quite... So would you pack that in a separate bag or drop it by a separate parachute or... Is it fastened to you like always? No, you 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 must uh, pack it very carefully uh, and and protect the camera. Uh, you will carry it in your main your main bag because you cannot jump, uh, let's say, with a parachute with a camera around your neck or in a in your side pockets or or stuff like that. It will it will get uh, damaged. So you have to protect it with some material and pack it in your backpack. And um, you must pack it in your backpack in such a way that you know that the big bag 
uh, when you jump with a parachute, you pack it in such a way that uh, the most valuable stuff is at the top and the bottom of your backpack will hit the ground. So the camera is, is protected. And that's not only the camera, that's also other equipment like night vision equipment, um, you know, very sensitive equipment uh, radios as well. Um, you don't pack it at the bottom of your of your backpack. You put pack it on the top, and you protect it with with some material, uh, so it is it is protected f uh, with regards to shock. You know, when the when the parachute hits the ground, so that the equipment is still intact. I'm often asked, you know, there's a lot of people who watch your videos. As I said, you have a leader here, and I don't think someone's going to get close to you. Um, everyone asked me about night vision equipment. When the Special Forces started using this uh, night vision equipment? Um, we use night vision equipment a lot. Um, uh, I think the reconnaissance, the reconnaissance teams will will take uh, night vision equipment with them. Uh, I mean, it's an essential piece of equipment for 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 reconnaissance. <clears throat> but we also use uh, uh, night vision equipment uh, in many other tasks uh, and ways um, for traveling. Uh, uh, we call it also uh, driver's goggles that you you know it's a it's a mounted. Uh, night vision that you can drive with. Uh, you drive with a vehicle without lights. So you've got vision, you can see where you're driving. It's quite scary though, especially if you're a co-driver co and you don't wear uh, night vision equip equipment and this driver drives like hell and you don't know where he's driving because you can't see nothing but he can see. So it's quite scary uh, to drive at night without lights and only the driver know where he's going. But also other tasks uh, like night vision equipment for the snipers. We've got uh, night vision scopes uh, that the snipers use. And uh, then we've got other night vision equipment just to, to um, uh, the, especially the reconnaissance people, uh, to, to look at night at the top of it and the surroundings. So we use night vision equipment a lot. Uh, I just want to mention that um, you get uh, passive night vision equipment and you get active uh, night vision equipment. So uh, we, we don't use the, uh, the, uh, the old generation, which is, um, uh, what do you call it, infrared. Because infrared um, uh, is, is, it's got a beam, you know, it's got a beam which the normal eye cannot see. But if you use active, uh, a passive um, night vision equipment, and you look at someone that's using a passive night vision equipment, then you can see the beam, and you can pick up that person. So uh, we we use the the passive um, night vision equipment. I'm curious to know. Let's say that there's an enemy ship lying in the harbor, and for some reason, let's say it's a submarine. Some reason. Head office wants to know what propellers or system this thing has. Uh, we would then go and swim under the water to take pictures of the hull and of the, uh, the props and, and whatever. Would it be for Ricky or would that no, be that's under, the... the, under the small team? No, that, that will be specifically a, a four special forces regiment task. Um, they will do the diving and, and, and the reconnaissance, let's say, uh, to, to, to do a recce under a ship to see, um, you know, what is going in a harbor inside um, underwater. That is a four reconnaissance regiment task. That's not a task for the normal uh, small teams or whatever. No. But you must also remember there's also small teams in four recce, that is divers. So they will do that type of task. Uh, I must mention to you, there's a task that Foriki did uh, in water, in, in a river, where they demolished a bridge, where they, they swam un, underneath water. And um, because the bridge was, was um, guarded, and um, they went, and the only way to get to that bridge to demolish it is 
by by diving by divers from four special forces regiment although it's in the bush in the river they did it they went underneath uh, and it's crocodile infested um, water and they went underneath the water and they placed the charges they swam back and they demolished that bridge um, the guards pick up one of the I don't know if movement or what even in the water and he fired at them and um, the one uh, colonel he became a colonel later and also officer commanding he got uh, hit in the arm and the other the other diver uh, uh, was caught by a crocodile he, he and it's also written in books uh, where he swam and a crocodile came from behind and 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 bit him over you know from the back over the legs and stuff and the crocodile uh, uh, took him down to the to, to the bottom of the river luckily he had uh, oxygen tanks and he had oxygen he could he could uh, breathe and keep on breathing while fighting the crocodile and he stabbed the crocodile with a knife and the crocodile left him and he survived to, to tell the tale well it's I've heard that story. I just wasn't sure that it's actually the truth because imagine that having a fight, knife fight with a crocodile. And this is a wild crocodile. This is not the tame thing. This is a big man eating crocodile in Africa. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's just amazing. Yeah, his, name was Ant yeah. his name was Anton Bjergman. Uh, uh, we spoke about it not, not long ago about the crocodile incident. Well, we would love so, to get yeah. him on this show to hear what, what exactly happened that night. Um, it's not easy to swim under the water no, I, at that night. I mean, well, you see nothing. I mean, how do we even know where we're going? No, you. No, and the water is not clear. I mean, uh, it's quite amazing how they did it. But they did it, and they demolished the task, and they went out. And, and, and you know, what also happened is, um, you know, the team that swam underneath the water, um, they swam together, but they've got lineage that is linked to them, you know, the different guys, so that they don't lose each other. So with this crocodile incident, I don't know what happened to the lineage that maybe they cut it or something. Uh, but the colonel that got hit in, in the arm by this one guard on the bridge, um, he swam to the, to the RV point. And Anton Bergman, that was the guy's name, uh, that was caught by the crocodile. He didn't arrive there yet. So they thought, no, they lost him. He's gone. But later, Anton Birkman rocked up. Luckily, luckily the, the, the RV uh, was open. Um, RV stands for Rendezvous Point. Uh, so they kept it open for longer to see if Anton Birkman won't rock up. And luckily, he did. Because uh, RV always stays open only for a, sh a period of time. Uh, after that time, you must go, you know, you leave it. So Anton Bergman came late at the RB, but luckily he was not badly injured and, and stuff like that. Um, because I think the equipment that he carried on him saved him as well. You know, the crocodile uh, maybe found out now listen this is not human uh, this is not fresh you know it's not a wild animal or something because it's something funny which he's not used to and and maybe that was part of the uh let's say the lucky part of this whole crocodile attack and um you could fight the crocodile he stabbed it with his knife and he and he got out but he went out to the to the bank immediately he didn't keep on swimming so he walked on 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 the on on land to get to the RV point. So the distance from where he left the the water on onto to land and walk it was quite a distance that he has to walk, and that's why the RV point uh, they kept it open just to see if he would arrive, and luckily he did. Well, I think that was perhaps a wise decision. I mean, if you're bleeding. And you're in the water, you might attract even more crocodiles or whatever else there is. Oh yes, for sure. Tell me, is it is it different to place explosives under the water against a pillar? 
than would be on top of a water, or is it basically the same same idea? If 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 you're allowed to tell us that. Um, yeah, you see, um, if you if you uh, decide in your young career you want to go to four special forces regiment in Langebaan, then you do the divers course, the attack diving one. It's a four-month course, and attack diving two is another four-month course. It's an eight-month uh, course diving, and then they do part of the divers course. They do underwater demolitions. That's a separate course. So they are highly qualified to use explosives underwater, and the explosives that you use underwater is not the same as explosives on land. Uh, some some of the explosives is, is the same, but some of it is not. It's it's manufactured for underwater. So they they are specialists in, the, in that type of 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 explosives. So they do it in the at Fort Ricky uh, while doing the seaborne course. Would you know if it's the same if you want to take a picture in the dark without using a flash under the water? As would it be? Above the water. I'm just curious now. Because surely no, you can't make a flash underneath. Them, yeah. No, you cannot. Um, and and I must I must admit that I don't know of any underwater photography that's been done. Uh, it m might be. I don't know. Uh, only four special forces members. One of the members there can can brief you on that. I cannot, I cannot brief you on that. I don't know of any underwater photography. It might happen. I don't know. But I think uh, only a force, special forces uh, member can, can give us that feedback. Well, I'm sure we'll get hold of one of them uh, at some stage. And I will remember this question. Now, I, think, I think you must get Anton Bjergman to talk to you because he's the, uh, the member with the incident with the with the with the crocodile, so he can brief you on no. that as well. They didn't give him a nickname or something after that, Mister Crocodile or something like that. <laughs> no, uh, it's not like Quiz Crocodile. I don't know if you heard about this guy, Quiz Crocodile. He was in three two battalion, um, a sergeant major there, and he he got caught by a, a crocodile as well, and he also fought off the crocodile. Maybe it wasn't a big one. That's why he beat off the, the crocodile. But later then, he was called Quirk's Crocodile. No, uh, Anton Bjergman didn't get uh, uh, a nickname after that incident, no. Okay, no, that, that's astonishing. But now I need to ask you, we need to go back to your favorite subject, and that is the Special Forces person, the mind, the man. I would, and, and, and I know you said in a previous lecture for us that they're basically the same people. You really go for the same type. Uh, so with this small team, uh, guys, we would really prefer small teams. Are they different in some way, the way their head is, uh, is ticking? Are they, or are they a breed of their own? No, uh, they are different in a way. But not not completely. Uh, you must remember one thing that uh, members of special forces that decide to, to 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 specialize in small teams, they were normal operators as well. They decided later to to become a small team uh, team member. But um, as I said before, they they are a special breed of 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 operators. They they are different. Uh, if I can take um, Captain Diedrichs or Colonel Diedrichs, um, uh, when, he, when he did uh, reconnaissance, um, when he was a young officer, a lieutenant and a captain, uh, he was definitely a different type of operator than we were. We, we uh, were more um, aggressive in a sense. We want to uh, make contact with the, with the, with the enemy, whereas um, Colonel Diedrichs was a very offensive person. He he wasn't he didn't like contact with the enemy. So um, so he, he he went and and specialized in, in reconnaissance. So 
I worked a few times with with uh, with Colonel Dietrichs, and he I see him as a as a different type of operator than than the rest. But I cannot I cannot uh, mention all the small teams operators the same. No. But there is a is a slight difference. Yes. If I can put it in the negative, so is it possible that you can find an operator who will definitely not want to be a, a small team operator if you had a choice? Oh yes, like me. That was not that was not for me. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't like to do uh, small teams. Um, I knew everything about small teams because you speak to the members. You know, they they your buddies. And they're, they're your comrades, and 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 sometimes you do operations together. Although it's small team, and you and you a normal special forces operator, uh, you talk about it. So that's where we get our information from. So I just just decided no, that's not for me. Um, and there's many operators that that feels the same. That uh, that small teams reconnaissance is not for them. As I also said before that. All special forces members do reconnaissance at some stage, uh, but not that long distance, long range um, reconnaissance like the small teams do. No, uh, and you know uh, that the, the reconnaissance we we did in the past, the smallest team we did reconnaissance was the four man team. You know, there's there's some kind of protection if you run into into the enemy. I mean, four four. Four operators can do more damage than a small team of only two. So uh, we did in the past reconnaissance um, before myself in a team, but that is not long, long uh, distance reconnaissance like um, Captain Diedrich did in the past. No. Uh, that is not for me, for sure. And uh, many of my mates also say, no, they will never do the small teams course. You will recall, so in, in a previous episode, you told me about these two special forces members who qualified and then they went to the military academy and they came back and they fell under your command and uh, you were really working with them and they had to go out now to get experienced uh, because we're officers as well, and you were marking a base for an airstrike, I believe. Uh, Correct. This is not the same thing with a, with a small team to do that type of work. Would it be possible that the small team can be watching a base and for some reason they decide to bring in an airstrike and leave the people there just to direct it before they move out, or would it? Is that not the procedure? No, that can happen. That can happen, like like the example you mentioned, and that I, I mentioned in a, a previous session as well. That uh, these two uh, officers they went out and did the reconnaissance on on this uh, enemy base, and they and we brought in the airstrike on that. So uh, a small team, um, a small team group that does these long distance reconnaissance, they can bring in the airstrike. For sure they can, or or even artillery uh, barrage. Uh, they can they can bring in artillery fire on that target and and direct the fire on that specific target, which is done before. Yes, they can do that. We'll make a decision. We we will tell them to direct it, or will they they self decide that Lucas is a very important target. It's got to be destroyed, and will they then call in the the strikes, or will somebody in head office decide, well, since we're there already, can they just mark it for us? No. If if it's decided that the airstrike must be done on a target, it's it's decided right in the beginning with all with the orders given before they they go on that task. It's decided then. You cannot decide uh on 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 a you know when you do a reconnaissance now you see a target now you bring in a, a airstrike no it's not done like that um, it is done at the base with the preparation and the orders beforehand and also the pilots of that 
uh, of that of those aircraft will also sit in with this briefing in the beginning, uh, so that the operators know exactly who they're talking about and and they all know the procedures exactly what is going to happen. So it's done in the base uh, with the preparation beforehand and with the briefings and everything. So if there's a task uh, that they decide it must be uh, uh, demolished by artillery or airstrike with aircraft, it will uh, be decided way beforehand uh, and not on the target itself. How, how far would you say would have been interference from head office on the operator in the field? And if I may, I, I recall you last week saying to me, you captured these Russians, or part of your platoon got hold of them after the aircraft got shot down, you had to go up and down as they were trying to make up their mind who's going to keep the prisoners of war. Uh, in general, how far is the interference from head office or is there no interference at all? Well, uh, with that incident with the, with the two Russian POWs that we've got, um, I don't know exactly what happened at, at the headquarters site, but I can imagine that there was a big shuffle because uh, there's a radio group that speaks directly to, to UNITA, and then our commander at the HQ, he speaks to higher, higher command and, and, and get information from them what must be done. But we on the ground, we know nothing about that fight in, 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 you know, on that level. We don't know anything. Later, we, we found out that there was a, a big scuffle about it. Um, and, you know, there were words spoken and and some were angry with other people and stuff, but we don't know exactly on high level what is happening there. We just uh, work on orders on the ground and we execute those orders and that's it. Who develops these films? I mean, once you've taken a picture, this film is still within the camera uh, in those days. Today, I suppose it's on a memory stick or something also in the camera. Uh, who would develop it? I mean, you can't take that to a local Kodak shop or something. So, so you would walk out of it, and then what happens? Okay, when we when we go on an operation, when you return, um, you you must give in the 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 school to the intelligence. All our units has got the it's got a intelligence section, and there's a senior officer there, and he takes. Uh, the spool immediately and what happened to the spool from there we don't know but later let's say it's it's a target that we must attack later then that intelligence uh will come and brief us accordingly uh, you know according to the photos that they receive so they keep the photos so we the photos will never go back to the to the unit or to the operators it's been kept in files or safekeeping at the, at the intelligence office. Okay, now I must ask you, why would the Air Force not just go and take a picture of this breach on 50,000 feet? Why is it necessary for special forces to go and do the job? Well, as I said uh, before, firstly, um, there were a breach at Shangongu, a very long breach that was that was uh, protected by anti-aircraft anti -aircraft, uh, guns as well. So uh, it's, 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 it's very important to go and do a reconnaissance to see exactly what weapons are they using. So uh, a bridge can be demolished by aircraft, that, uh, that is possible. But also the bridge, if it's a certain size, then they can damage the bridge, but not, not demolish it completely. So it's, it's necessary to do reconnaissance uh, on the bridge and they can decide, can an aircraft uh, demolish it or, or must it be done by, by members on the ground to go in and demolish it? So they decide that after the intelligence comes in uh, and they um, look at the intelligence and look at the size of the bridge and stuff, and then they will decide how they are going to demolish the, the bridge. I must, I must mention to you, we've done 
reconnaissance at the target in in Mozambique uh, many many moons ago ago and um, and that one task they decided that aircraft must bomb it and 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 demolish that target and then later they moved the target because all the uh, the enemy was not taken out completely so later we did a similar operation and we went in uh, by by vehicles and men and we attacked it by foot and um, and then we we demolished the target completely and we um, captured a lot of those um, enemy and we killed a lot of them so we we were on the ground and then you know that that the target is demolished completely but that's not all you also uh, that specific target there were um, documents um, uh, highly secret documents of the enemy that was in the offices of that target and you cannot take it out by aircraft you, you need those documents to take it back so men on the ground uh, can go into that target demolish the target and then go afterwards and we sweep the target and we get all the valuable information like documents and stuff like that and videos and and you can take it back home for further analysis. Well, that must be the ultimate of precision strikes. Because, you know, people these days are doing the lazy thing. They, they have a drone. Obviously, no uh, anti-aircraft fire or anything. So they have complete domination. And then it seems to me they just shoot at anything that moves. And they often kill the wrong target. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Um, maybe the Americans got technology to to strike a a, a target that is that is um, you know clearly visible and identified, and you hit the target once with a drone or or, or, or aircraft, and um, it's and you know exactly that's the target and it's hundred percent. But I don't think we've got all that technology to do that. Although we've got some of the technology to do it with laser beams and stuff, you know, men on the ground to use a laser beam and they bring in an aircraft and then the laser takes over the missile and then you demolish the, the target. But I think um, in our environment and in the past, I think foot on the ground is better than, than strikes or, or artillery fire on a specific target. Artillery fire is more um, uh, a widespread uh, target, you know, uh, members on the ground and vehicles on the ground and stuff like that, uh, and for aircraft for that for that purpose. Um, but smaller targets, you know, a, 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 a fixed target like a building or or maybe a big bridge. I think foot on the ground to go and demolish it i think it's it's better but that's a personal uh, opinion it's not a professional opinion because you will find that a, a pilot will say no aircraft can do it as well and we can deliver bigger bombs than you can carry and and you know stuff like that but uh, as i mentioned that in some instances um it is it is better to have foot on the ground because they can uh, collect equipment uh, there in offices and, and, and take equipment back, which aircraft and artillery cannot do. No, that's very true. That's very true. So it seems to me that the purpose of a, of a small team is never to fire a shot, never to be seen, to get the evidence and get out. That's 100% correct. They will avoid contact with the, with the enemy uh, with all cost. With they will not make contact with the, with the enemy at all. It doesn't matter if it's one person or a group. They will uh, ignore the, the enemy and, and, and do not make contact with the enemy at all. They will do reconnaissance and withdraw uh, in a clandestine way and move out without being seen. If they are picked up, they will withdraw completely and, and move back and do that reconnaissance over 
at a, at a different time or a safer time. So if they are picked up or or seen or whatever, they will withdraw from that operation, that mission, and go back another day. They will not carry on. That must take a lot of, uh, what do you call it in English now, self piercing to be in control of yourself, because your first instinct as a soldier when you see the enemy is to shoot him, and you ever just ignore him. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is true. Uh, the small teams, uh, but also us, when we, when we did reconnaissance with the four-man team, you also um, uh, stay away from, from contact with the, with the enemy. Um, that self-control is obvious. I mean, you, you are um, ordered in your orders not to make contact with the enemy and, and stay away from any enemy uh, control points or enemy movement or whatever. Uh, do the reconnaissance. That's the task and move back. Nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. You do the reconnaissance, you move back, because that was the main purpose of the operation, is to get the intelligence on a specific target and bring, the, bring that intelligence back uh, for, for analysis and later uh, maybe attacks or whatever on that target. Well, it seems to me that it's impossible for an army commander to plan his operations if he doesn't know what the enemy is, where they are, what they do. And without special forces telling him, he's, he's, he's blind. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, a small, a small team's uh, operation where two people must go in very, at, you know, very far distances and, and do reconnaissance on a task. Uh, I mean, they, they don't know exactly where the enemy is. They don't know where patrols are moving. So... They, they must use uh, the night for, for cover and they, 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 they sleep in the daytime. They lie up and they camouflage themselves and they lay down so that they are not picked up. So the main movement is at night, not in the daytime. They don't move at, at, in the daytime. Uh, and the, the main reason is for them not to be picked up by the enemy. If they get spotted or picked up, they must withdraw and um, and they must uh, cancel that operation in toto and go back and maybe do a reconnaissance at the later stage. Yeah, that do take a special kind of man, you know, to be able to say, no, I have to, we be compromised, we have to get out. I want to tell you an uh, incident, what happened, and I can't remember the team, but it was a reconnaissance team. Uh, they did a reconnaissance on a military base, an enemy base. And this one operator was lying in the bush at night and, and he was um, taking photos of the base and the fences and stuff. And one guard of the enemy came out to the bush to have a pee in the bush. And he was pissing on that operator. Can you believe it? In the bush where he was lying. <laughs> he so didn't he, see you. <laughs> he could not move. He could not move. He could not make a sound. Now, he could not shoot him, which I think what went through his mind is he want to kill this guy who, who pisses on him. So, <laughs> so that happened. And um, he was just lying there. He couldn't move. And then the guard went back. And he went on with the with the reconnaissance. Well, that, that's probably the luckiest guard you've ever seen in your life. It's amazing. I think the enemy is the lucky. You mean the enemy? He was the yes. guard. He was the He's luckiest guard. He's the luckiest guy in the yes, world. Because sure. I don't think that would have happened yeah, anywhere sure. else. He might have had something cut off right there and then. <laughs> yeah, they seem to be a breed of themselves. Yeah, I just uh, want to. I'm listening. Uh, I just want to mention because one, one reconnaissance uh, uh, operation I did, um, I took a, a Portuguese-speaking guy with me 
uh, and we did a reconnaissance on a, on a town. Um, that was the town opposite um, Rundu, uh, because we attacked that base with with uh, with Unitas um, uh, also involved in the attack on this town. So me and this Portuguese guy, uh, which was also an operator, um, we went in at night and we did the reconnaissance on on that town. And we were walking inside the town, checking the, the um, what do you call it? Um, you know, all the places where the guards was and also the, the trenches, where the trenches were, everything. And we did it for two nights in a row. But that wasn't a reconnaissance that is the same as this long range, small team uh, reconnaissance. I mean, we crossed the river high up with a boat and we walked up to the town. We did reconnaissance uh, that evening and we went the same evening before first light, we were back in the base because we were based in Rundu and we did the reconnaissance on the, on the town just opposite of Rundu. Uh, I can't remember the town's name. I think it's Kasheki or something like that. Um, and we did it for two nights, me and this guy. We brought back all the information and we attacked shortly after we attacked that town. Um, and we took over the town. But you need to never, never rocked up to help us to attack this place. So we did it alone with only a small group of people. Yes, I've heard the stories about the Special Forces people being right inside the base, or like you now, right inside the town, the enemy town, walking around, trying to look casual, I suppose. What, do you go, what goes through your mind when you're doing that? Well, you, you're nervous, for sure you are. And, and um, I must say, you're scared, because you don't know what to expect. You do this late at night, uh, early morning, uh, around about between one and three o'clock in the morning. You do all your movement before that time up to a certain spot, and then you go into the target uh, uh, late, late night, uh, one o'clock in the in the morning, because that's the time when the enemy is fast asleep, and that's the best time to do your reconnaissance if you want to move up to the target, right to the target where there's enemy around. So you, you, you know these guards because you watch them uh, before one o'clock in the morning, before you move in, you look at the base with night vision equipment, look at their movements, look when they change guards. And then uh, we were lucky that at that specific target, um, the guards went to sleep. There were no guards from one o'clock. So we could move in easily and look around there move around because I think if someone saw us, we wear the, the uniform and, and rifles and stuff and we use black is beautiful. Uh, so at, at night, I don't think they will think it's not one of them. So we were lucky we were never picked up. But if we were picked up, I think we will ran like rabbits to get out there and, and and go back to our base, but uh, it never happened. And we brought back um, the intelligence that was needed to attack the base. Um, I'm, I'm so impressed. I'm, I'm quiet for once. I can just imagine how that, that must go down. Is there anything else about the small teams which you can tell us, which we haven't covered? Yeah, I can just... Um, mentioned that um, there's a lot of stories going around um, these small teams and reconnaissance. But uh, I can uh, clearly say to, you, to the people that's listening and to yourself that they did a very good job in the past. I tell you now, they were brilliant. I want to I wanna tell you a story uh, of the Israelis, there was a time that we communicated and we um, gave a lot of information to the Israelis and they gave us a lot of information. I mean, uh, we were 
uh, uh, let's call it uh, uh, friends in that sense. I mean, I went to Israel and I did a course there and um, they didn't hide any information from us and we also didn't hide any information to them. When we mentioned to them that we do reconnaissance and we mentioned that reconnaissance of, of, of uh, Diedrichs that did that reconnaissance so far away from our country um, on their own, completely cut off from any support from the South African government or the military. We cannot reach them, it's too far. They are solely on their own and they must look after themselves. When we told the Israelis that, they thought we are lying because it's not possible. And also there were Americans that say we are lying that's not possible. If you look at the reconnaissance capabilities of the Americans, they do reconnaissance, yes, but that's the reconnaissance that our normal um, military can do. Um, uh, for instance, you see in, in our SADF and the SADF in the past, you get reconnaissance groups in all the units. You know, in the parachute battalion, you got the reconnaissance platoon and they did reconnaissance but they did that short distance reconnaissance just to go closer and look at the terrain maybe look at the enemy and they come back they don't do that uh, intensive reconnaissance like special forces like we do and when we told the israelis and some of the americans and the sas in england they they thought that is not cannot be true. It cannot be done. There is no way that that the reconnaissance team can go and do a reconnaissance without any close support. You know, helicopters or or, or aircraft that can support them uh, or give them any support or air, or boats. You know, from from the sea, um, give them support, fire or whatever the case may be. They really thought it, it is not possible. And also the, the Israelis, and we know the Israelis uh, very well. I mean, they are a force to be reckoned with. Um, they are one of the best, they've got one of the best armies in the world. Um, so we invited them to South Africa and we showed them the course. We showed them what we can do. We showed them photos that some of our people did. And only then, when they saw how we do it, then they believed us. But before that, they did not believe that it can be done. But we can do it. We can go very far from here, do reconnaissance on a target and get back uh, in a clandestine way without being picked up and bring back valuable information with, with no problem at all. Do you know when the first one was done? No, I think before my time. I don't know. I don't know that. Uh, and I don't know all the reconnaissance missions that's been done. I mean, there's no way that I can know them all. Because as I said to you, some, some uh, uh, reconnaissance been done by, by four Ricky or by five Special Forces Regiment. And I was maybe at one reconnaissance regiment. And I don't know of all those reconnaissance uh, missions that's been done. But I know quite a few. And also, uh, it's been mentioned in books nowadays. So you can, you can read about it in, in the books that's been written, especially the reconnaissance that Diedrichs did. Um, he did uh, quite a few. And also, there was a, a, a very great uh, a reconnaissance specialist that was in one region. I knew, know him very well, and that is Jack Griev. And Jack Griev. Uh, I think he did the reconnaissance on the libido um, mission. Well, it seems to me it's an amazing thing to have for the army to be able to do these things because that ensures success. I mean, once you know exactly what to attack, it is not that hard to attack it. Well, while it is hard, I'm not saying it's not, uh, but without the knowledge, it, it's impossible. Yeah, um, remember I mentioned that I won't say that to do, uh, I mean, in, in a conventional a conven conventional warfare, um, they attack with tanks and, and do artillery and infantry is on the ground. I mean, they don't do reconnaissance for that. They just move and they, and they attack. 
But as I mentioned before, um, uh, good reconnaissance is, is, is very valuable and it saves lives at the end. Good reconnaissance to bring in valuable intelligence on a target or the enemy uh, will eventually at the end save lives. And that is the main thing about intelligence and, and reconnaissance. Well, internet, you know, when you hear these stories, it really is amazing. And it's impressive. And uh, you have to be proud. You have to be proud that we could train people to do what uh, RSM Tatra was just telling us about. I know I'm proud. And I also know that uh, current special forces, you know, they, they just improved. They, they're still doing these things. Uh, really, really impressive. And next week, RSM will tell us another story in another episode. And that episode is going to be about emergency drills. In other words, what happens if something goes wrong? Don't miss it. I think it will be a great episode. Thank you to all of you for listening here. Your thumbs up for spreading the word. The nice letters you wrote to me, the ones you wrote to uh, SW for e regarding his book. If you go to the websites of uh, George and James, as well as uh, Legacy Conversations, you will find the details of how to get hold of uh, SW4E, so you can order the book. Uh, it's really worth your while to read it. I myself read it. Uh, my wife, Rebecca, edited it to us, for us. It's a good story. It's a good story. So thank you to all of you. Until we meet again, God bless.